Hi, and welcome to the webinar. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar is produced by Underserved Victim Populations Training Project, a project of the Center for Innovation and Resources, Inc. Funding for this project comes from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Victim Services Branch, with funding made possible through the United States Department of Justice Victims of Crime Act. For those of you who can hear me, this might seem obvious, but I just wanted to remind everyone to turn on their speakers in order to hear the presentation. Use the question and answer or the Q&A feature to ask the presenter any questions that you may have. We will begin with questions that have been emailed in prior to the live session. For tech support, the chat panel is where you can ask questions. We will answer questions immediately in the chat panel. Now I would like to welcome our presenter, Jenny Aguilar. Jenny Aguilar was born and raised in New York. During high school, she obtained a job at Planned Parenthood and found a passion in talking with youth about sexual health, education, and prevention. While in New York, she had the opportunity to do research with commercial sex workers, looking at the rehabilitation and recidivism of sex workers and the hierarchy within sex workers. After obtaining her bachelor's and master's degree at California State University, Monterey Bay, she relocated to Sacramento and obtained a job with Sacramento County Child Protective Services and their permanency department. Jenny worked as a permanency social worker in the CSEC unit for about two and a half years, a forensic interview specialist for one year and is now the ILP social worker for the county. Jenny remains passionate and active in harm reduction and believing in meeting all parties where they are at. Now I will um, give the reins to Jenny. Hi everybody, good morning. I am just getting my PowerPoint set up for you. And um, start. So this is my first webinar, and I am really, really excited to um, to just share this basic information with you and go through um, really talking about the importance of sexual health. Um, I know a lot of times it can be this really awkward topic, right? And you know we're trying to figure out what is sexual health. Um, how do I start this conversation, and who do I have this talk with. Um, like like they were saying, I worked for Planned Parenthood when I was in high school. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And there they shared the belief that we should be talking about communication as a form of sexual health and starting that um, really young. So we actually started working with um, children in kindergarten and first grade about just communication and talking about what is okay and what isn't okay and, and really laying the groundwork there. Um, and, and kind of building from there. So um, I'm super passionate. I love talking about uh, sexual health, people taking care of themselves and their bodies. Um, and I found this, and I found it to be a really great way to encompass what sexual health is, but also break it down. So, um, it's sorry, Jenny, is the is your PowerPoint up? Yes, it is. Can you see it? Um, we're, I'm seeing like a um, an internet browser. Okay, let's try again. Sorry. Go, that's okay. You can go to stop share and then try sharing again. Share. Okay. And then just make sure you just click on your. There we go. I see it now. So just go ahead and start the slideshow. Perfect. There Better? we go. Yep. All right. Sorry about that. So yeah. So like I was saying, you know, sexual health is definitely an awkward topic. Um, and I found this to really help break down um, when we're talking about what sexual health is. It's, it's that being able to enjoy a healthier body, a satisfying sexual life, a positive relationship, and a peace of mind. And I know when we're talking about um, youth, and this could be youth who are uh, receiving mental health services, who are in foster care, they could be in 
extended foster care, juvenile hall, um, or even just part of community um, resources, it can be hard to have these discussions just based on a variety of challenges that they may be having. Um, but I really like being able to break it at, into these sections, right? So it's just overall health and well-being. That's really important. Um, and it's also important to be able to have that communication. You know that not every individual is able to have communication perhaps with their sexual partners, with their partners they're in a relationship with, um, or even their healthcare providers. So just trying to lay that groundwork where we can talk about what sex looks like, what a sexual health looks like, what do I want, what do I look for, what can I do to remain safe, keep others safe, we'll kind of take it from there. And um, as I was saying earlier, you know, it's like, why do we have to be the ones to have this talk? Um, but as I looked at all my experiences working with different populations, I realized a lot of times we are the first ones to have this talk. Um, and that can be for a variety of reasons. And I wrote here intergenerational issues with limited exposure. And, um, you know, we see a lot of intergenerational patterns with youth. And that could be that, um, perhaps their parents were, um, part of the foster care system and may not have had a lot of great exposure or, um, connection with different people. And then you have um, incarceration. If an individual parent or parents or grandparents or whomever was caring for them was or is incarcerated, they may not be having those conversations. And we also talk about teen parents. Um, teen parents don't always have a conversation. And so um, it can be really tricky, I think, to find a way to put ourselves in that position to have that conversation um, and, and go from there. Um, and when the youth are in care, care providers aren't always having those conversations. Um, and I think that can be for a variety of reasons. Um, primarily, um, if they are in you know, a foster home or a resource family home, maybe those people don't have um, values that align with talking about one's body or identity or um, sexual health or reproductive care. Um, they may not be comfortable with it, and they also may not have the facts. And without the facts, they may not want to <laughs> either give the wrong information or, or not even know where to start with giving information. Um, for children that are in care, um, be that foster care, they may be part of the juvenile justice system, um, a lot of moves happen. And so with a lot of moves, I think it becomes a, a disconnect of education as well as care. And with care, I mean, um, you know, medical care, mental health care, um, just basic care. So, you know, trying to piecemeal all different things that they're learning either from schools or mental health providers or community resource with Changing locations can be pretty challenging. Um, and I'm a big believer on being um, proactive. Let's have proactive care instead of reactive care. So, talking about what we can do to take care of one's health, one's body, one's choices before we get to some major problem or hiccup or concern, um, I think it's way easier than you know, getting the phone call that. Um, they have an STD, or now they're uh, they're pregnant, or um, you know they've been hospitalized for for maybe a suicidal ideation. Or something. Um, so some statistics I found were that at the end of 2016, the U.S. had 437,500 children in care, and that's a lot of kids. Um, you know, we're talking all different ages, with all different ages comes all different. Um, areas of life that they're at. Children in care uh, have an increase of sexual health issues. Um, so we're talking about you know, STDs or STIs. It could be um, lack of resources or being able to access different health care. Um, girls who are in care have a higher chance of uh, pregnancy by 21. 
um, I think I was reading it about three times. Um, and as many of you probably know, you know, there's this increased focus on the C-sex population with commercially sexually exploited children. And um, they've been around, right? Um, but now we're really trying to, I don't know, catch up with, catch up with them and get this information out there. And um, you know, the, the World Wide Web has really been a, a great thing, but it has also created some challenges. And we see youth who are getting further away from their um, place of origin, where they're not being able to maybe access certain um, care or people that they had connections with. And I think that can really um, harm them in the end. So first, I wanted to talk about um, you may have to just click on the PowerPoint um, at the bottom and just go to next slide. Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, I think a lot of times we hear the term STD, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, we actually refer to them as sexually transmitted infections, but um, I think that the term can kind of be used both ways so that people are familiar with what we're talking about. And here's just a, a brief slide um, breaking down STIs that we often see with um, people who are sexually active. Um, and, and again, that could be that they are choosing to be sexually active, or that could be through some type of force or coercion. Um, and, and one of the main challenges is under that testing section there, kind of like a pinkish color, looking at the results, the amount of time it can take to get the result, that can be a while. Um, so if we're talking about a youth who went to a clinic and said, I want to get tested for every STI out there, right? And the results aren't um, readily available. Uh, they may not be getting the results, right? And so then if we have a youth who is um, perhaps a chronic AWOLer and uh, goes in, gets tested, and then he or she decides to AWOL and they're going to go far away and not be able to access these tests, they could be positive and not even know that. Um, and then the other component of that is that treatment. Um, you know, the, the area right next to it. A lot of them talk about not having sex for seven days. Well, depending on the youth and where they are at, um, not having sex or sexual intercourse for seven days could be a challenge. Um, and I think that can be um, for multiple reasons. There can be force and coercion, like we were talking about. There's the survival sex component. And then there's the sexual exploitation component. And so if there's really no um, option, they're not going to be able to ab abide by what they were being told. So they, perhaps they got tested and they got their results, but they're not able to abstain from the sex. It's Kind of double-edged sword, um, and we really try to talk to them about getting tested, getting the results, and then following through with the treatment. Um, but you know, we're well aware how far that can be. This chart I like a little bit more just because it's easier to read um, in regards to some of those symptoms. Um, but like it says on the bottom line, any STI can be present without any symptoms. So um, that's where that talk comes in about just taking care of yourself on the regular. Um, pick a time that you can remember. Um, you know, I don't know, like the holidays between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then maybe in the springtime, you know, summertime, Fourth of July. Pick some times that you can remember and and really go get tested. What does that look like? What should my frequency be like? Um, and something that I really try to instill with the youth I work with is that you know you and you know your body and you know what you're doing. The unfortunate thing is, is that we don't know what other people are doing. Kind of like drivers, I think about. I can be on the road and I can be really safe and I can be, you know, looking at the, the 
stoplights and the stop signs and trying to watch all of my surroundings, but I can't control all the other drivers. So, yeah, you know, I'm in the driver's seat of my car and I got this, but I still have to be thinking about other people and where they're at, what they're doing. Um, and that's where that communication piece comes in, and I think that's a real challenge, is depending on the youth and um, who they're engaging in um, sexual acts with, they may not be able to have that communication with that partner or that person. They may not be able to say, hey, wait, or stop. Um, and so just taking the time to respect themselves and check in and try to get care, I think, is, is the best that we can do. I also always say, like, if they're willing to do, um, let's say, they're willing to have sex with you and then they say they don't want to use a condom with you, there's chances that they're saying that with other people as well, or they've said that before. Um, and, and that can be a hard pill to swallow, but I think it's also that um, taking a realistic look at what's going on. Um, but when we talk about sexual health, it's, it's not just sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. It's the component of taking care of myself and using um, different types of reproductive contraception. So times are changing. There's all different things out there, which I think is so awesome. Um, I remember, gosh, I don't even want to date myself, but when I first started at Planned Parenthood, the, the primary thing was the pill. And the shot was coming out, but it was kind of new. It was kind of, you know, people weren't really sure about it. Um, but yeah, things have definitely changed. And what I try to look at is what can I use that I feel I can remain in control with? So, you know, the thing with the pill is it's every day. We try to talk about the importance of taking it every day at the same time. Um, but with any teenager, whether they are part of um, a system or they are living at home in a very traditional setting, is we're busy. We can't guarantee we're always going to you know, maybe have our first with us at 3.30 every day. Um, so taking a look at what what works for me? What is best? How can I um, take care of what I need to take care of for myself, but also, you know, keep on top of things? Um, so, you know, the shot is every three months. Um, again, it's important every three months. So for youth that may be moving around a lot or um, don't really have access to care, that, that could be a challenge. Um, and so then we kind of go into the different ones where we're talking about like um, an IUD, and that's the three to ten years. So looking at how old am I now? What am I looking at in my future? Um, am I a person who you know, wakes up at different times every day, or am I on the move a lot? Do I have access to different types of reproductive care if I need it? Um, it's just having some of those things, we have the, the vaginal ring, the navel ring, the patch, you know, and then we move into um, the only two that prevent STIs, right, which are the condom and the female skin. So we're talking about needing to use it with that consistency every time we have sex. And you know, like said, the most different populations, we can't always ensure that's going to happen based on different, you know, um, scenarios, different things that are happening. Um, I know within uh, commercial sex work and sexual exploitation, you know, there's people who pay more money if they don't have to use the condom. And so we may have youth who need to meet a quota or survival sex and we need a certain amount of money. And so we're willing to skirt around maybe what we, we always use the condom, but this time, this person offered $500. Well, that might change how we're looking at it. So, so talking with you about what their options are, but also giving me um, the dosing, like what that looks like and how often 
I think, as a, as a really important part of having that conversation. Um, and letting them know uh, they can access these things all over. So if we have a youth, and I live in Sacramento at the time, so if they're in Sacramento, but then they get to LA, they can still access some of these things. It may not be as um, easy or quick as if they were going to their same clinic every time, but they can access these things. Um, so I want to share with you guys a true story about a youth that I know. Um, I called her Crystal, and she's a 16-year-old female. She's been sexually exploited for the last nine months. She's a chronic A Waller, and she identifies as bisexual. She noticed and discharged about six months ago, and has a history of polysubstance. Around this time, she'd also been A Wall, and she was sexually exploited and not having protective sex or using crystal meth, heroin, cocaine, and Xanax. She came back into care and received birth, the birth control shot and a prescription for gonorrhea. She was, she was also directed not to have sex for at least seven days. After getting this information as well as her prescription, she AWOL two days later and for five months. So Crystal recently came back into care. She reported that she did not finish her prescription for gonorrhea. She continued to have unprotected sex and she did not go back for her next birth control shot. She reported that one of the main reasons that she didn't want to go back was that she thought that somehow people would know she was on the run and that they would call the cops. Um, and I think that this is something we have been hearing a lot. Youth not wanting to access different services just based on the fact that they are worried about um, getting picked up, if their exploiter catches wind, if you know, they don't want to have to go back to whatever placement they were in. Um, a lot of our youth, they don't want to go to juvenile hall. And so they do everything in their power to remain out of the hall. And um, that can include a lot of unsafe practices. So, um, you know, things to think about are like, what are the issues with Crystal? You know, where does one even begin um, addressing things like her? You know, um, and, and what can we do now, now that she's back in care? And, and how can we move forward with Crystal in talking in regards to that sexual health component, which is, you know, taking care of her, her body in, in its whole, you know, thinking about what she wants, what she um, is feeling like she can do, you know, um, and really taking the time to explain even the repercussions, you know, I'll talk with you and, you know, they're not worried about things because maybe they don't want to have a child. Like, okay, well, you know, um, taking care of our body now can allow for things in our future. And so just taking the time to, to hear their reasoning and also work through that with them. You know, I, I understand where you're coming from and, you know, I wouldn't want to have to go to the hall either. Um, but just know that you have the right to access care. You have the right to services. Um, and, and working through some of that, I think, is that underlying self-care that we don't see happening. And knowing the challenges are there, knowing that they are going through a lot, whether they are in foster care or they're not in foster care. I think being a teenager right now is like, a hundred times harder than when I was a teenager. And so they just have so many influences and you know, different things happening. Um, and you know, a lot of the times I think when we talk about sexual health, we're talking um, in regards to individuals that either identify as heterosexual or um, maybe they don't even have a sexual orientation, but they are having sex with someone of the opposite sex. Um, and so, Really, I mean, sexual health is for anybody, anywhere, um, and you don't even have to be having a, a sexual partner, per se. It could just be how they're going to take care of themselves or their body. Um, but also knowing that sexual health doesn't just rely on relationships. 
Um, have been hearing and sometimes we're trying to understand how do we either use them or when a youth tells us this, you know, sometimes they're talking about what are they even talking about right now. Um, but pansexual is, is no limit to a sexual choice. Sorry, Jenny, did you yeah. mean to exit out of your PowerPoint? Oh, no, I'm looking at it okay. right now. So just go back to share screen and just do that one more time. There we go. Okay. So just go into this, um, the slide view. Perfect. We're so back. the pansexual is, um, they don't really, um, are, they're not concerned with someone's biological sex or gender identity or any of that. And um, a demisexual, which is a term that was kind of new to me, is the sexual attraction after there is a strong emotional bond. So perhaps. You know, think of like somebody and their best friend. There's a very strong emotional bond, and then all of a sudden, the sexual attraction comes about. Um, and then another term I've been working with a lot is um, MSM. So men that have sex with men, but they're not identifying as gay or bisexual. And um, I think of this a lot of times with that sexual exploitation component. Um, we also sometimes are seeing that with individuals who are using different. Um, substances and are wanting to engage with sex with um, another man, but they're not wanting to be used to sex term or label, which um, kind of goes into that fluidity component where I was just talking about is that we um, are seeing a lot of youth who just don't want to label themselves or they don't want to conform. Um, they don't want to have to fit into some type of what we deem as a norm. And so, um, you know, I've had youth who really have struggled with their sexual orientation or who they are. Um, and so it'll be a female who 
is sexually exploited, right? But she actually identifies as bi or as gay. And it's hard for other people to understand, like, well, hey, over here you're doing this, but, you know, over here you're doing this, and, and why are you doing this, and where are you at? Um, I just think that we need to take them for where they're at, go from there, and, and kind of just continue to check in and how can we engage them in sexual health. Um, so as a mental health provider, the social workers and case managers, we are seeing these issues. Um, studies were showing about uh, 5 to 10 percent of the foster care population identify as LGBTQ IRA. Um, and the RISE project in LA is saying that down in LA, uh, they have about 19 percent of their foster youth in the um, category. If you will. We also talk about um, there could be more, but there's a lot of fear of disclosure. Um, disclosure, even if they are in their own home, um, but just not really comfortable because of family values, community values, religion, um, or just not sure how their parents would react. Um, and when when youth are in care, a high number of them are talking about abuse and harassment after they are put in out of home care, which is it's sad to think, um, you know, I had a youth and I remember uh, she came out to her mom as being gay and um, her mom beat her for that and, you know, she ended up being removed and put into care and then she kind of felt that, you know, that harassment continued in the placement she was in and it's like, well, we removed from one environment, like for, for her mom's actions and then we put in this other one that's supposed to be this safe you know, um, all inclusive environment. I think there's a lot of fear of losing placement when a youth um, may be in a placement. Maybe they've been there for a while, or they're just really close to maybe aging out, or um, moving into a, a different environment. Uh, they don't want to share because it, maybe they don't think that they can stay there anymore. Um, the homeless youth population is 20 to 40 percent. All within the LGBTQIA um, area. And then we have that survival sex and sexual exploitation, like I was talking about before. Um, so we have individuals who um, may identify as straight but realize that they can make more money um, if they are willing to engage in sexual acts with other men. Or perhaps a girl who really does identify as being gay but her exploiter. Who, who has all this power and control is, you know, having her have sex with other people. Um, and survival sex is, is out there. And, you know, unfortunately people have realized, you know, different ways and avenues to, to make money. Um, we talk about the mental health issues and the emotional issues of this population are definitely higher. And um, hospitalizations due to suicide attempts and just feeling um, completely hopeless about what their life is going to be like. Um, in California, we have the SB 731, which is giving child welfare workers the ability to place youth according to their identity. And I love this. I think this is awesome. I think it definitely places a challenge on some workers um, just based on how we're working with different homes or, um, you know, the different <laughs> places we have out there. But I think that we should be able to live with people where we feel we match. Um, and also, their ability to have workers who have that cultural competency, who can be sensitive. Um, you know, I feel like youth are already going through a lot, they have a lot of challenges, and then the last thing they need is to have a worker who perhaps doesn't need to help or not understanding where they're coming from or, you know, why they are binding or why they wear certain clothes. So uh, I um, have two different slides for this, but we call it what the SOGI. So SOGI is sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. So um, sometimes these all kind of line up and match, sometimes they don't. So this little uh, ginger person talks about, you know, up in the head is our identity. I feel like I am as 
girl? Am I a boy? Am I a man? Am I transgender? Do I not want to conform? And my heart is, who am I attracted to? Who do I like? Who do I want to engage in perhaps a relationship with? Or maybe is that asexual component? There's nobody. I don't like anybody in regards to attraction. The biological sex is you know, what we are born with, so are we male, female, or intersex? And that gender presentation is that expression. Um, do I want to present myself super feminine? Do I prefer to be masculine or androgynous? Um, I have to admit, I love this little unicorn. I'm not sure why. I just think it's, it's really a great way to see where things are at. And it's talking about, to me, that spectrum we talked about, right? So, I could be, you know, identifying as a female, but maybe my presentation isn't super feminine. Maybe I'm in between. Maybe I am very happy being a female and want to continue being a female, but I prefer that I look more masculine or anti. So I really like these. I think that they're easy um, to understand. And sometimes when we're working with our youth, this can be one of those things that we can work with them on. Um, a lot of pressure from society, family members, community members, and things like that. And so, yeah, I was just I was just working with a youth and been going to some um, LGBT support groups. And for us, it was really awesome. She shared that you know her worker put that into her case plan because she needed to figure out who she was before she was in the community. And you know. <laughs> I have to admit, I kind of gasped and I was like, whoa, you know, why, why do you have to know that? Um, and she said, well, no, you just said that I should really know who I am by the time I'm And, you know, there's many of us out there who don't know who we are now, and that might change our choices of, you know, how we want to represent ourselves or how we're feeling, you know, can change, and that's completely fine. And so letting um, individuals know, hey, you are who you are, um, I'm here, let's talk about what we can do to keep you, you know, healthy, happy, and safe, and that's really, you know, all we need to be doing. Um, so really taking the time to bridge that sexual health component that we're talking about, um, one's identity and their sexual orientation, and it kind of got me to take like a you know, mash it together like a big sandwich because I think we need to be addressing all of these. Um, and so just taking the time, I know it can be uncomfortable talking about certain words. Um, you know, I remember back when I worked with the center at Hunter, we would have um, these mirrors and be like, you know, penis, vulva, you know, just really getting comfortable saying different words and understanding how how they play into the conversations that we're having individually. Um, and I, I just love this because I think this is just really encompasses so much about you know, knowledge, safety, inclusion, self-esteem, consent, communication, taking all of those things and that's really what sexual health is. Um, and I want sexual health to be this like perfect, easygoing topic where everything is great. Um, Unfortunately, we live in a world like that. So, some great goals would be like, you know, partner communication, use of condoms or other barrier methods, and getting regularly tested for STIs and health um, But obviously, when we're talking about all different youth who are having a hard time for a variety of reasons, how do we? Take these goals and make them theirs. Um, and so that was something I was asking myself, you know, like, how do I take what I think should happen and, and focus on their goals? So um, talking about what do they want? What are they looking for? What are their thoughts on how they're going to accomplish certain things? You know, and, and how do we check our biases at the door when we think we know what they should do? Um, and what do we do when we think their choices aren't the best ones? <laughs> and 
when they have no goals or plans or ideas, what do we do? You know, I, I look back at some youth and think, mm, I really wish that could happen. Or, you know, we had a youth and she'd been in wall, gosh, I think over a year. And she'd call, FaceTime, text, and one day she'd call from the and her boyfriend had a syphilis. And what was she going to do, right? And so, I'm going to sit and talk to her. And, you know, she talked about how she would probably never have um, unprotected sex again. And all of these different things, which I think were, were great ideas. Um, but how do we implement them when I'm just not going to work for them? Um, you know, we see a lot of how you make scared or um, unplanned pregnancies. And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. How do we have that talk? You know, I, um, I'm pretty frank with a lot of the youth I work with, but um, gosh, a week ago I had a youth call and mm -hmm. I'm pregnant. I said, okay, well, you got three choices, so <laughs> let's talk about them. And if one of those choices isn't good for you, then let's just take that one off the table and look at the other two. You know, um, what are your thoughts? What do you think? How are we going to come up with a plan that is going to work for you? And again, it's that proactive component that I think we really struggle with. Um, and I can understand when any teenager is a challenge and then to add, you know, even mental health to the piece of things, you know, long standing trauma, attachment, all of these different things and components. And then say, and on top of that, I really need you to look like, you know, take your pill every day. Or every time you're going out, make sure you have condoms in your bag and your pocket. That's, that can be asking a lot. But looking at what our options can be so that we don't have to be reactive. We don't have to deal with the problem once it's you know, sitting right there in our face. Um, I really, I try to have these talks and uh, be, be realistic about it. How do we um, engage our youth in these conversations, especially when there is perhaps a hierarchy, they feel that we're in charge of them, or that we're authoritative. Um, but really saying, like, no, I just, I really just want to talk with you. I just really want to. <laughs> talk about what is going on and what can we do and how can I be there for you. Um, you might, you just exited out of the screen, so you might have to go back into that. Okay, we're back in. I think you have to just click at the, there, oh, you exited out again. Get the hang of this, I guess. Okay, so just yeah, from current slide, and then I just wanted to remind you, we do have just one question in there right now. Um, okay, but whenever you, whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So you know, just like I was saying, is that talking about that sex component, the the big awkward part. Um, we can talk about taking care of ourselves, we can talk about taking care of our bodies, we can talk about all these awesome things, but it's time to really talk about the ugly part um, and what do we do. So I always say, you know, sex happens, and, and that's a fact. We don't have any uh, thing we can do about that. And so, um, oh, there's a question. I have a question about gay males who prefer to themselves as chasers and maybe pur purposely trying to become HIV positive. You know, I've, I've seen and heard about this as well, and, you know, I, I can't say that I really understand that. I really try to have conversations about what that looks like, um, and, and why. What is the attraction, or what are you thinking will happen if you become infected, or we're seeing sometimes people who want to infect others. Um, but I think having that conversation about, you know, what do they look like? Like, what are we talking about for our future? Um, and something that I really didn't get into, but I can go in quick, is um, for those who are high risk, 
um, accessing the medication called PrEP, which um, if they feel that they can't engage in safe sex, and that would be because of, um, you know, the coercion, the exploitation, um, or whatever may be happening, they can take this pill every day and it can help reduce um, the transmission of HIV. Um, but yeah, so just understanding things don't happen the way we want them to. Um, but talking about our options, talking about what our life looks like, talking about um, you know, what what we can do to meet them where they're at and how they want us to work with them. And um, I think that that's just really the, um, the main thing. What can I do to, to work with you? Um, and so I, I love harm reduction. I've been working with harm reduction for, I think, 14 years. Um, and I originally started working with us in, in legal exchange. Mm -hmm. But really seeing how we can use this in avenues such as sexual health. Um, and so it's a safety net need. Um, so I talk to them and let them know that I have these conversations with everyone. Um, and also, what excuse me, what does that look like? Okay, we just have a couple questions here. Um, does Medi-Cal cover IUDs and parental consent? How do you prevent abstinence part of the sex talk? So um, with Medi-Cal, so I think there's a couple of different options. I believe Medi-Cal is, is covering reproductive care. Also, um, the link of places such as like Planned Parenthood, um, you know, they work on side and skill, they work on income, and they take into account. Also, um, they only need to be well and older in California. So I, I really try to, I mean, I have these conversations at a young age with them, but yeah, trying to um, put that out there for them, that they can take themselves, nobody really needs to know what's going on, um, and respecting their space, their body, and understanding that perhaps wherever they're living, um, they may not be okay with what their sexual choices are or how they want to take care of themselves with their reproductive care. Um, and I will come back and answer this question. So, yeah, you know, in that harm reduction component, it's having conversations. Um, making blanket statements like, oh, I heard that blank is doing a walk in sex one day. Um, just kind of throwing that out there, letting them know about places that don't have a cost. Um, having information for local agencies as well as being for sex materials. Um, I started keeping at my office um, a big thing with condoms and booze and dental bands and information, and I am surprised and would love to see how many workers are taking that stuff with them when they're going out. I love it. Um, if you have a relationship with them, offer to take them um, to wherever. But also, if you don't have a relationship, I think this is a great way to build that relationship. Hey, why don't I take you over to whatever it is, to the gender health center or wherever, and we can grab lunch afterwards. You know, um, just taking that face-to-face -face time and maybe you should, having it out of the norm. But letting them know, I have no problem taking you here. Or, hey, let's go by here and see what they have going on. Um, and letting them know their rights. You know, like I'm talking about, you know, you have rights to access, you know, reproductive care. You have rights to access and health and mental health services. Um, be real, be genuine, and let them know that you have their back. You know, I think we're in these jobs and fields for a reason. And we believe in advocacy, we believe in, you know, taking care of, taking care of ourselves, taking care of them, and offering that support. And I think that's going to be a hard thing, um, especially for youth that have had a lot of transitions, a lot of movements, a lot of placements, um, and things have fallen through. Is, does anybody really care? Does anybody really have my back? Do they really get what I have to say. And um, I'm just having conversations 
conversations in a casual way, if that makes sense. Um, you know, if there's a, a private interview, you know, you heard about something that's happening and they're giving away tickets for something. Um, you know, let them know, hey, I have this opportunity that something you might be interested in. And, um, you know, really getting to know who your community resources are, I think is a big, big component for, um, for these two. Is, you know, hey, I heard, um, the LGBT Center has a Dawson Center, or hey, I heard, um, you know, the Gender Health Center is doing uh, testing, or I, you, know, you can go and get, um, you know, a lot of incentives. I think youth work really well with incentives, so getting incentives to go get tested, but trying to build all of that in together, I think, can be a really awesome way to kind of get that underlying uh, message there. Um, and then, really, just taking the time to, to hear what they have to say. What's working for you? What's not working for you? Where are you concerned? Are you concerned about your partner or your choices or you've noticed some changes in your body and you want to have them address? Really hearing where they're at. Is um, yeah. Just about to wrap up. I have a couple of questions here. Um, yeah, talking about those um, who would exploit them, I, I try to be more casual about those conversations in regards to, um, you know, hey, you know, we know there's these people out there and they want, um, <laughs> You know, they want to kind of take advantage of you. If you hear about like, some grooming, I think that's a big thing too. It's like, well, I met this person and they told me I was really pretty and then we started hanging out. Oh, I got this, this new phone or this guy was telling me that if I did this, he would do that. Yeah, you know, just really listening to what they have to say. Um, and Anna was asking, what are dental dams? So, um, dental dams are, a, um, a barrier that you can use for oral sex. Um, it can also be used for anal sex. So it really, it's honestly like at the dentist, there's those like um, sheepy things that sometimes they'll put in your mouth when they're working on like one area of your teeth. And so um, that's pretty much what it is. And so um, I think it, it's something that's probably widely underused. But just kind of working with them on how can um, I implement different, you know, barriers, or how can I implement different types of um, sexual health, um, you know, protection. Um, right here. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm talking about you know working with um, you know different support groups. In um, finding places that have little to no cost, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, I think drop-in centers are great too, where you don't have to have appointments. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and someone was talking about abstinence. Definitely, I think. That, oh, and where would someone get them? Um, dental exams can come from all over. Um, I would say any type of um, agency that is working with. Um, harm reduction, any type of um, sexual health clinic, things like that that might um, be able to offer uh, different supplies. So yeah, um, LGBT centers, center health, and parenthood, um, different things like that, health centers or harm reduction agencies. And for abstinence, I, I, t I have that talk. Um, I really can't think of any of my youth who were abstaining from sexual acts or wanting to. And so letting them know you can abstain and what does that look like. Um, also with that harm reduction is a spectrum, right? Like um, I had a youth and uh, she was sexually exploited. She was a couple months pregnant. 
and she told me that she uh, didn't want to have sex with her drums anymore. Right? She was over it. Um, and so she was giving me hand jobs or blow jobs and how she felt like she could kind of protect herself. Um, and I found that really powerful. I, I told her not really impressed with the way that she was thinking about herself and what she wanted. And, um, you know, I, I thought that was really awesome. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's this awkward giving suggestion kind of phase because we're like, well, what do I say to you? Um, but let's try this. Um, I had, I think she was also talking about, um, she was doing some like fetish work, right? Because she was pregnant, she didn't want to be having sex. She was also, um, trying to meet her quota for her exploiter. And so, um, she found herself looking at different ways to um, make money without having to engage in actual sexual acts. No, I don't. I think you've gotten to all of them. Okay. all I have for today. Um, I hope this helps and I will make the PowerPoint available. I will be sending it over to Amy and she um, can share that with everyone. And if you guys have any questions, please um, feel free to let me know what I can do or how I can help. Um, and I had a really great time sharing my information with you guys. And um, this is these talks have got to start with someone, and so um, why not let that be you? Let our youth know that they can talk with us, even as awkward or uncomfortable as it may seem. They're definitely, um, you're definitely willing to listen and, and work with them on that. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yeah. And I just wanted to let everybody know, all of our participants know that um, after you leave the webinar, you will be prompted to fill out an evaluation for the webinar. So we really appreciate if you could go ahead and do that. And as Jenny said, um, she's going to be making the PowerPoint available. Um, they'll probably be in the next couple days. And also this webinar was pre-recorded, so it will be on our website um, next week. So thank you again, everybody, and have a great day.